Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Adam Carter. I'm the Director of Product Management at SolidFire. Um, we're going to spend uh, a little bit of time here um, talking about some of the stuff that differentiates us, but most specifically, some of the stuff that was re really recently announced with our carbon release. Um, if I switch to that carbon overview real quick, um, actually, I'll, I'll back up a second. Carbon, um, if you've never seen us do any update before about our software, um, we actually name all of our releases after the periodic t table of elements. You can look at that and know what every single release name is going to be from here on until we apparently run out of elements to name things. So after carbon will come nitrogen, would be the next release we'd be updating you about someday. Um, Carbon's release um, was first shown um, at an event uh, in Boulder that we held, and this is probably one of the first times we've actually talked about it uh, publicly uh, since then. Um, so I want to give you a quick update about some of the stuff that's in element six. So even before I go into some of this stuff, the, the thing I would point out is as a primary storage system, especially at the scale we're talking about, um, you know, as opposed to some sort of point solution that's just after you know, owning one particular bad behaving performance app in an environment, there's of course expectation from our customers to basically do everything as far as storage services go. We're asked for um, every possible storage service that's existed and will exist is, is asked for from our customers regularly because they're looking to replace a broad spectrum of the applications and storage that they use with one system that's going to be able to do everything on it. So there's a lot of conversations always about what's, what's the highest priorities as far as the different types of features you could build. And Carbon Expose is one of the biggest rounds we've put out of that feedback coming in and us putting out new features. Um, since the original GA of the product. So around that, there was the fiber channel connectivity. I'll talk about that for a bit. That's been a big demand you know, to a lot of the enterprise tier one apps. Um, can't say enough about how much feedback there was that you know, depending on your view of your data center and how you build things, fiber channel was an absolute need out of our system. Um, adding the ability to mix our different node capabilities was a big deal. It was something that was always kind of part of the product, but it took a certain amount of time to prove that out with quality that we could take any mix or match or of any possible node type that we have now or even in the future and make it so that that would be seamless. So we've been working on that for quite a while, but just now released it. Um, Real-time replication is, is huge. I think the very first customer, real live customer, long before we ever shipped a product that sat down and talked to us about what we could do, loved a lot of what the system capabilities were. It was exactly what they were looking for. Quality of service, the automation, the scale, this is brilliant. What about replication? It was like the very first big thing that was being asked for way early on. And real-time replication being native in the system now is a really important feature to us. And then integrated backup and restore is pretty unique to our system. Um, I think when you're talking about a system of the scale that we're talking about and how highly automated of an environment you're looking to build, a feature like this makes sense. I, at first uh, glance, a lot of people look at it and go, why did you build a, that integrated backup capability? And you have to imagine the world at very large scale a lot of times to understand why it's so important. So I'll dive into those um, each as we kind of go through what's new with this feature set. Um, the first one I wanted to talk about was real-time replication. Um, so real-time replication, I want to differentiate real quick against, because there's tons of different types of replication out there, right? A lot of replication solutions that are not true synchronous replication are really just some sort of point-in-time replication. They fall all the way back to, I'm going to take a snapshot and try to slowly copy this snapshot over to some other location eventually. So there's usually a pretty big gap between what synchronous replication is doing and what point-in-time replication is capable of doing. In, in our system, there's some serious challenges when you're talking about this scale and this speed of an environment, especially this low of latency of an environment, to try to pull off sync rep at this scale over a pretty standard network. While most people can do sync rep on their disk-based systems and kind of suffer the 20 to 50% adder for um, latency in sync rep, that might be all right on their disk systems. On a system like this, that would be causing 4 to 10x the latency yeah. on the system to put it in sync rep all the time. So not everybody, when we talked to customers, wanted to do full synchronous replication. There's absolutely use cases for it. There's really important ones. We're going to enable that eventually. Um, there, there's definitely needs for it, but the broader need was really I want that replication to keep up as fast as possible. I don't want every night that's practically backup. Um, I want this to be as up to date as possible, but I need to do it over the conventional pipes that I'm kind of doing sync rep over today. It was a lot of that conversation. So we built a replication engine that really would let us do um, all of that eventually, but right now we do replication as fast as the link will let us go. In real time, we send all of the IOs right when we get them. 
And so we keep the replication as up to date as that pipe will let us. That's typically going to be milliseconds, maybe hundreds of milliseconds, maybe even a second or two, somewhere in that kind of range of replication so that we can do large scale replication over pipes that people used to do sync rep on. We can do it on an all flash array in a native manner. Um, we also built this to be super flexible. Um, so when we look at a configuration, a lot of the concerns that customers had were like, look, I've got, I've got five data centers. Um, I've got services in all of them. I need to do different things with different services, and I need that to be really easy to set up. So how many systems am I going to have to build? Is it you know, two pairs that I put in each location? I have to create lots of pairs and hook them up, so I have to own 20 SANs just to pull this off. So we didn't build it that way. In our configuration, we pair up clusters. So it's typically a cluster in a data center that will pair up with other clusters. Um, we can pair up to a group of five, basically, together as if you want to do like a star topology of five systems that are all paired together so they can replicate in any direction. And then all of the replication is defined on a per volume basis. So that generally will be some particular application or some particular data store, or some particular tenant that you're going to define, great, I'm going to replicate this to this other one of any of the other four um, environments. And I'm going to replicate that in real time. And this builds in a lot of efficiency. So we've already got dedupe compression, thin provisioning. We don't want to lose that. We're trying to do massive scale over these pipes. Is that an extra license that you want to be able to buy? Uh, no, there is no extra license whatsoever for this. It's all included with the product. Cool. So other than owning more than one solid fire cluster, there's that barrier. But otherwise, there's no limitation on utilizing this. So this is pairing, so that's one ma master replica and then the, the slave replica, if you want to call it. it okay, it's not master-slave. Kind of. Let me try to explain that a minute. Um, so you pair clusters together just because the clusters have to be able to cross-communicate and say, great, I understand you, I understand you, we now have permission to, uh, to do replication, but there's nothing directional about that. Nobody's master or slave to each other. And then volume by volume, you pair up the volumes too to say, great, you two are a pair. And we designed it this way for a specific reason. I'll, I'll get there in a second. Um, once they're paired, you can do all kinds of things with the pairing, like say, great, I'm going to replicate in this direction. You can say, no, pause that, do something different. I actually want to replicate back the other way now because I want to fail back after doing some restore at one site and come back the other direction. And when you look at all the automation that it takes to, to do try that. to do multi-master, yeah, right? No, that's no, it's not multi-master. Okay, <laughs> it isn't. There's one master at any point in time. So if I, if I, the way it actually works in the system, if you get your hands on it, is you pair up these two volumes and one of them is defined as a target, and the other one is defined as something other than a target, generally a read-write volume. And based on that, the volumes know, well, great, you're the target, I'm replicating to you. But that can simply be reversed depending on what you're doing to the volume. So maybe I'll try to walk you through a pretty quick scenario. Though. I pair, let's say I pair these two clusters <coughs> together, and then I pair just one volume in the two together, and I say, this guy's, this guy's in read-write mode, this guy's in target mode. They'll light up and start replicating data to this volume over here. Now, where things get interesting, and we had to do a lot to simplify it and make it automatable <coughs> and easy to do via APIs, is make the idea that, OK, well, I can do all kinds of things over at this target volume. I could snapshot it. I could back it up. I could clone it. I could do lots of things to it and not interrupt a replication. But if I actually have some sort of failure over here in the south region, let's, let's say it's a power outage and not the end of the world, right? It's a power outage, so this is gone. I want to light up my DR site. That's great. I make that read right, and I mount it, and I go off to work. That's fantastic. Then power comes back here a week later, right? This can get really complex in a lot of systems. But when this comes back up, those volumes are still paired. They still know who each other is. It's as easy as turning this one into target, because this one's read right now. And they'll start updating the reverse direction. And then it's up to you whether you want to try to migrate back to here once they're up to date or just leave it alone. So the non-directional capabilities of it um, are there. And it, I'd be honest, they're not being fully leveraged yet. But as we integrate with more solutions that try to automate their DR, that'll be really important that they have all the metadata and all the pairing information pretty statically defined. And they can easily change things around about how they're doing replication, who's primary, who's not. Um, but there is still just one of those volumes that's read right at any point in time. How many targets can you have? One. Just one. It's one to one right now. So you can't replicate. Yet you can't yet replicate one volume to say three targets simultaneously in three different centers. Um, now, when I get to another feature in a minute, you, can do a to B to C? you can with another feature, the backup feature. You can do A to B and then backup B to somewhere else. Okay, but that's but that's yeah. periodic. 
not in real time, right? So you can't do A to B, B to C, all three real time. Um, these are all, this is now that the features, like people are getting their hands on it, starting to actually manipulate it. Hey, that is some of the feedback. We, we get asked once, for both of those. Once you have sync rep, that use case becomes more, you know. And the, and the right, data. Right, because you want to sync A to B yeah, within and the data center and then, and then A to C. lower B to C. Yeah, yeah. The data yep, is deduplicated that's replicated, or I mean, how yeah. So we we kept as much of the efficiency as possible intact on that. So we only send over, you know, actually when we're doing the replication, especially the initial lift of that replication, it, it's really up to the system that's receiving it to look at the data, um, the metadata, frankly, and decide. I already have that. I don't the need hash, to pull it from the you. hash. So you, value so you do a hash exchange yep. followed by a data exchange. So there's metadata that's exchanged, and only the actual data that needs to be pulled, data that doesn't exist there, needs to get pulled. So when you go back to my, sorry, if you go back to my scenario, that fail back scenario makes a lot of sense. A ton of the data is already going to have been sitting here. It was here in the first place. Now all I need to do is replicate back the changes from a week of running in production. And right? having having dealt with that on too many other storage systems, the vendors always go. Oh yeah, we only ch send the blocks that changed, right. and they're all lying. <laughs> <laughs> We're not lying. I have, Generally, I have, well, doing with, that with, is pretty hard. Because you have hashes on everything. Yep. Yeah. The the back the back loop of remote replication is at least in my experience with other replication solutions. That's generally much harder than we made it in this system to talk about. <clears throat> okay, you moved. Now how do I move back? And a lot of times it's like, well, you basically scuttle everything here and start all over again, yeah. and you can move back. Well, eventually. The whole the whole disaster recovery world. You know, we we worry about failing over. And then once you failed over, you go, oh my god, failing back is even harder than failing over in the first place. It generally means, no, nah, we're just going to leave it there. <laughs> we're just going to leave it. Well, except that it's at SunGuard and you're paying by the minute. Yeah. Yep. So one question. It's okay, SunGuard's our customer, so <laughs> we're good What's with it? that. SunGuard's our customer, so we're good with that. Going back <laughs> a little bit to the roadmap and question that got presented to me on Twitter is what was the challenge with not coming out with Fiber Channel out the gate? The comment is basically that uh, it shows a level of storage immaturity is the commoners. Maybe we're just immature. Um, maybe, no, the, maybe they know that the, the market they were initially selling into didn't use Fiber right. Channel in yeah. the first place. When you look at our initial customers, this is, and, and yeah. Dave could probably add more to this story because I, I, I joined, Dave got me to join the company. I was like, oh, okay, it's ISCSI only, interesting. Um, the the, the things we first sold to, the customers we were totally focused on were large scale cloud computing environments and their environments Fiber Channel actually didn't come up all that much at first. iSCSI was the obvious solution because it's so automatable, so flexible, something that they can code up to make completely automatic. Not something typically done with Fiber Channel zoning in environments. So when you look at something like OpenStack, for example, we, were, we designed and built around a lot of things in OpenStack from day one. That's why we're so well integrated today. It only supported iSCSI. So, and part of it too is, um, so had we, had we done both Fiber Channel and iSCSI, um, on day one, day one would have been later. So, yeah. Give, it, given it the, given the choice, yeah. uh, the customers that we were dealing with initially preferred <laughs> iSCSI, and when you look long term at where the market is headed, um, it was better to invest our core IP in the iSCSI piece first and make sure that was really, really solid because you know, Fiber Channel is going to be important to a subset of customers, an important subset for now, uh, but over time, I think we know which way the you know, direction is going. Yeah, the, oh. other, the other thing is you can't do fiber channel redirects. Yeah. Right, you, it doesn't it, load balance the same, it doesn't do a lot of things the same. Because it's just a layer two protocol, yep. you yeah. can't do a Cer redirect. Certain things are trickier about fiber channel too, so yeah. yep. it took time to get all um, those. When you think of SDN, the N never refers to fiber channel. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. So to, to wrap up on this one real quick, because some people had asked about it, um, a lot of the benefits around this are pretty straightforward. Tons of the applications running on this type of system need actual DR capabilities. And there are capabilities out there. There's capabilities customers have run on top of us, whether they're host-based or custom. But having native real-time replication in an all-flash all array is pretty unique and something that our customers have been looking for for quite a while. Um, we did mention before, not any add-on license. This capability is just included in the system. If you've got two clusters, you can use the UI or APIs to say, great, I'm going to pair those up and start lighting up replication between the two. Um, fiber channel. So uh, to talk through this one for a while, we've, we've already talked about some of the elements. We definitely um, got a lot of feedback, you know, especially early days when we were shipping at, at first, the first, I don't know, a few rounds of customers. Those were so large scale and automation centric that this wasn't that often of something that was coming up. But, but reality is, a lot of larger scale enterprise or traditional environments want those capabilities too. They want the same like automation, ease of use, 
the, the quality of service capabilities, they want those also, but they don't have the uh, advantage that some of the cloud compute guys did of building an environment from scratch. They have, they have an environment that exists today and it's massive and it's fiber channel. That, that just is what it is. Um, so while some of those customers we have been able to work with um, in between because they had some new initiative where they'd go launch iSCSI into it and that'd be fine, there's a lot of footprint that is fiber channel that wants these same capabilities, all these same features, all these same, and, and there's nothing inherent about our system that makes it all that different to do fiber channel. It's another block protocol, it's another pipe for us. Um, there are some architectural challenges we had to solve along the way to get there that took a little longer, um, but ultimately the two are gonna be equal for us going forward. Um, so when we look at our system today, so uh, we were talking earlier about, so we have individual nodes, uh, all nodes have 10 gigabit ethernet, all nodes are pretty much uh, the same other than sizes and some other things. Um, fiber channel will change that a little bit. There will be a fiber channel node, essentially. It's its own type of node. It's, it's a node just like anything else in our management. You want it in the cluster, you add it to the cluster on the fly, non-disruptively. That's great. Looks a lot like our other systems. It's another 1U um, system that has uh, four 16 gig fiber channel <coughs> ports in it, four 10 gig ports in it. The 10 gig is really there for its interconnect into the cluster. It's not used for iSCSI in or something like that. It's only a fiber, ch it, it's used for fiber channel access into the, the cluster, the four 10 gig or internode only. Um, and it's got management capabilities. This is really optional. Most people do hang their management and API off on a different network, but it doesn't have to be. Um, the real key thing for me here is that there's basically no limitation to how this is utilized. None of our features are excluded from it. None of our capabilities are left out of it. The system acts entirely the same from like a quality service, snapshots, cloning, all the other capabilities we have are equal. In fact, they're, they're so equal, there's nothing about the system that stops it from being fiber channel and iSCSI simultaneously to the same volume. I, so I don't know why anybody would do that, but that there's that much uh, similarity between the two. They're two different data paths to the same SCSI. So maybe I'm, I misunderstood what you just said or maybe I just wasn't listening. <laughs> I can take a fiber channel node, a mm -hmm. new fiber channel node and add it to an existing cluster? Yes. Yep. It's just another node added to the and, cluster. And, so and I, you know, to be honest, that's one of the main use cases requests we have this from our existing customers is they, they love us for their new cloud environments and they have all of this legacy that they want to start moving over to this as well and they want to add fiber channel ports and just start moving stuff over. And whether it stays on fiber channel long term or whether that's a short term thing, whatever. That's, um, that's their choice now. So it's, it's something that can be added to even the initial systems we shipped when we first went GA, we can add fiber channel connectivity to those yeah. original systems. Um, you know, like, like other capabilities in our system, so this wouldn't be just a single fiber channel node. Um, to be, for, the way you'll build a system is you'll add two of these nodes to a cluster. They're active-active, full HA between them two, the two. We can do non-disruptive updating. We can do all the things we're used to doing, um, just like the other nodes in our cluster do, as soon as we have two fiber channel nodes in the cluster. It also gives us the capability to scale out that system to to increase that part of the system also, and not just the uh, iSCSI part of it. The, both are still a scale out design. Do these nodes have any storage on them or are they just no. purely? Today they don't have any storage in them just for mostly for real estate issues. There's no real architectural reason why they couldn't carry storage like the other nodes do. Okay. But um, when you look at the guts that goes into one of these, there's, oh, there's yeah, not enough yeah. in there. Yeah, that's basically. sheer curiosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, someday, architecturally, um, we built it somewhat that way, expecting that eventually the hardware will probably make it possible for us to just combine everything into one. But the other factor is we didn't want to force people to add more capacity when they just wanted to add fiber channel. Right. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's get to the more interesting stuff. Oh. Um, How many fiber channel nodes in a, in a cluster? What's that? How many fiber channel nodes can you have in a cluster? Uh, in its initial release, it's just two, but that'll be, that's a limitation for us to get it to market as soon as possible. We'll be able, there's nothing about it that stops us from saying, sure, why not three, four. Three's funny because nobody thinks of odd numbers, but there's nothing wrong with three. Four more in a cluster is totally something we'll be enabling here soon. <laughs> Um, so mixing nodes, this actually has somewhat to do with us just pointing out there's now fiber channel nodes. Um, the original system, even though it had this as part of its design, when we shipped it, we did kind of lock it down. If you built out of the three terabyte node, you continued to scale out of the three terabyte node. Um, there's nothing about the system that truly limited that. It's just a lot of qualification work to prove out the, the resilience of the resiliency of that and to make sure all the load balancing and other things that people think about as being complex that we just made that simple and handled it inside the system. 
The real key here is we've got three different system sizes and shapes, so they're different capacities, different speeds. Um, customers generally pick based on you know, what their requirements are in their environment, how big of an environment they're gonna build. Um, now that they can mix them, and I mean literally mix them, they can take a cluster and just put anything they want in them um, as far as you know, if it's built out of 30 tens now, they can put 60 tens in it, or put a 90 ten in it, put two 90 tens in it, put more 30 tens in it later, it doesn't matter. Um, they can mix that any way they want. They can now even better dial into exactly what capacity and performance they need. Uh, that's very useful. The other part that's useful is it also lets you start out a system. If you've got, you know, a lot of customers have this, they, they'll have a significant install, but then they want to light up four more data centers. So they're just adding four more data centers. That's a significant uh, system. They don't want to add it with the biggest, densest node, which is usually the best cost metric node. So they'll add it with the smallest one, but then they want to scale with the best cost metric nodes, usually the biggest one. So I've got 30 tens or something like that. I want to add a 90 10 to scale it someday. We can enable those now. The other thing that's really the key part for me is if I flip to that, is the future proofing of this. So there's now no reason for a customer to fear any sort of forklift upgrade ever in the system. When you go back to the scaling down aspect Dave talked about earlier, this is true too, that look, I, can, I can have a system like you were describing. I, I built it out of the smallest node. I've had it for ages. I've been scaling it. New, faster, bigger nodes with better cost metrics have come out. I start utilizing those. And now replication comes out. Well, maybe I want to take the smallest nodes out of that cluster, pick them up, move them somewhere else, and start replicating with them. That's is completely simple to do in our system. And any future capabilities, you know, we're of course, I'm sure these are not the, the end of the nodes, right? There will definitely be faster, bigger, denser systems that keep coming out. That's the treadmill that the industry is on, right? We'll always be building something bigger, faster, better. And customers have no reason to fear that, nor have any concern about what that upgrade's even gonna look like. They're gonna see that new node and go, oh, that's fantastic, I, I love it. It's super fast and it's even better dollar per gig and it's even more dense. I'll take one of those and I'll put it in my cluster and keep moving on. So the, the future proofing of this is fantastic. And the last one that I'm gonna cover real quick is integrated backup and restore. Um, so this one's really unique on the system. Um, you know, backup's a, a big deal. I feel like it's, it's ignored all too often, but um, while there's, you know, traditional backup capabilities can be leveraged against the system, we can mount snapshots, we can do VSS, we can do all kinds of things. Doing backup at very large scale in a very automated fashion. You know, imagine um, even to the extent of, I've got maybe you all as consumers of my service and I wanna just expose to you a button that says, I wanna be backed up, or I wanna be backed up once a week, or I wanna be backed up to this. Please add that service onto my current offering. And the idea of being able to scale that and automate that really easily is not that simple in traditional backup architecture. Um, so we've added on a capability where we can directly back up our volumes to anything with an S3 or Swift compatible API, um, and to ourselves. We can also basically replicate at slower speeds, do a point in time type of replica using this feature also between our own clusters, so it's useful for migration and other reasons. But the backup piece to be able to talk to anything with an S3 or Swift API, which could be literally S3, or it could be some local Swift you built, or it could be some other vendor's object store that speaks those APIs. And pretty much every object, yeah, pretty much every object store speaks S3 now. So whether it's Atmos, right. whether it's Claversafe, whether it's Scality, pretty much anything you can find on the market that's an object store, we can talk to. I haven't been able to find one that doesn't speak at least one of those two. And that's all included. Yes. Pardon me. It's yeah. We don't sell. We don't. We don't have the object store. You got to buy that for someone else. But right. otherwise, good to go. Yeah. yeah all included. Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Those nasty spinning disk things. You need. Hey man, they're good for something. <laughs> yeah, they're good. Spinning. They're good for backing up too. Um, you know, the the migration piece of this is useful. Um, the backup parts. You know, we, we're seeing a lot of different use cases. I mean, that can literally be a customer who wants to, for some reason, back that whole volume up to Glacier or something if they really want to. Um, the, the more common use case is uh, it, somebody actually having something on their own locale that has that API, whether it's tape or a large disk-based system that they can back up to. Um, and this is all just native into the system. It's, it's literally a API call or one GUI interaction, hit OK, and you can back up a whole volume to it. Um, but it also does support, it supports incremental restoring from that, resumes if it's disconnected. It's got a lot of the, the expected things in a, in a feature like that. So you mentioned people would use it for migration from one array to another. So yep. that, does that mean that you can actually expose an S3 target for, to migrate from an old array to a new one? I wouldn't say it's an S3 yeah, target. It, it uses a native protocol for, yeah. for solid fire to solid fire. It doesn't yeah. use S3. Yeah. Okay, cool. But, so when the two are talking together, they, they talk their own, our own API. Because um, there's an API, of course, behind that. 
Um, the, the less sexy name for it is the bulk volume API. Um, so we, we move volumes around through that API. So it's like we support three different APIs, our own, Swift, and oh, S3. So you could actually migrate a single volume from one array to another one yes. if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nice. Yeah, so you can pick them up and move them pretty easily. And, and there's a difference there. We were talking about real-time replication earlier. Real-time replication, you could have done the same thing, but it's a heavier lift to get pairing set up and better networking and all that. This, this just can run over practically anything that could route. So right? I'm not limited by having to pair up clusters. Nope. This, in order is, to do this that. is calling a go. command on one side that it's going to catch and the other command to point at it and say go. Sure. That's it. Nice. Um, so like the other parts, nothing, nothing add-on for this. This is included in the system. Um, the APIs and the UIs are just there for you to use. Um, it bas basically provides a massive scale integrated backup solution and gives us migration capabilities too. One way I'd highlight, because there's a lot of use cases that get enabled by this, one use case I'd highlight just because it helps me kind of tell the story a little bit. Um, if you look at Cinder in OpenStack, Cinder has a capability to backup instances, and it understands how to do that. Uh, that's great. It has this huge drawback that it has to disconnect those instances while it does that backup, because it literally takes it offline, hooks up the volume somewhere else, and runs the backup through a server pretty much the old school way in the background. Um, I our Cinder integration. Met anybody who thinks that taking their application offline to back it up is acceptable? No, I think that's a horrible limitation. It's, right? it's a reference implementation. <laughs> Um, Reference so to what? <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to what this can do now. Um, so, so this capability now lets us, under our Cinder driver, ex look like we're exposing the exact same capability, except there's no need for us to disconnect it. We can, we can run the backup directly to Swift in an a OpenStack environment from an instance while it's online, but utilizing the exact same APIs that have already been sitting in OpenStack since I think it was in uh, Grizzly? Um, no, Havana. Anyway. That's one of the use cases that this enables now is for doing that highly automated, you know, just have a button in a dashboard that I can do a backup. Um, so I'll wrap it up there unless there's some questions I can answer and let Dave pick By the up. way, one thing I'm not sure, it was on the slide, I don't know if he mentioned it, one of the coolest things about the integrated backup is it's incremental. It uses our metadata to know the next time you run the backup, what changed, and just send those blocks over. Uh, and it does it incremental in such a way that you can do uh, essentially some of the generational backup things people used to do with tapes, but you can actually throw out backups in the middle. So if oh, you want to oh, keep a you're, month, you're week, doing nightly. Essentially change block tracking. Well, except change, change block tracking without the, plot, without the block tracking because the metadata itself keeps, we know what changed. Right, well, yeah. 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 That could yeah. come in really handy for things like big databases where you just never have enough time to back them up. Absolutely. So you can run your first backup. It may take you know a while, um, but then you can do incrementals on whatever interval you want. Well, I can take a snapshot, mm -hmm. back up the snapshot to do the initial one. Well, and, and all of our all of our backups are snapshot based anyway. So it's yeah. whether you take a snapshot or whether it does. Right, you're gonna, yep. 